to this wonderful occasion, a very special occasion. This is the first in the Lee Rainwater Lecture Series. Um, my name is Tim Smeeting. I, uh, I'll tell you who I am in a minute, but first of all, I want to thank Janet and Mary Waters for doing the organization. If you want anything organized, get Janet. And if you want to any, do anything at Harvard and have the facilities and everything ready, go to Mary. So I know all the life, all the life lessons and her staff, uh, Janet will mention. I want to thank our good friend and colleague, Robert Erickson, uh, for coming to speak, and the rest of you for coming out in the rain. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, what we're going to have now is a 30-minute short uh, program of remembrance of Lee. I must say, I, I met Lee in 19... 83, and he said that uh, some people said you'd be crazy enough to go over to Luxembourg and uh, try and build this uh, data project. And, uh, and I said, well, we'll give it a try. And for the next uh, 25 or six years to 23 years, um, we built something called the Luxembourg Income Study. And along the way, I got to know him, his brilliance, his quiet. You will hear somebody say, if they don't hear him say, Lee was the brains and Tim was the engine, which is pretty much of, of less. Anyway, we built this Luxembourg Income Study, which we've given to Janet now, and Janet has done amazingly well, has built it up, has two offices. She's got Paul Krugman on her team. She's got Bronco Milanovic. She's got 62 countries, and Phil is really happy. So there. Um, but Lee was also a co-author. He was a father figure to me um, when a dad passed away in 88. Lee and I had long talks about that. He was a tutor. He taught me to drink wine, not beer. I'm always grateful for him for that. Um, and two years ago, my university gave me a Wharf name distinguished professorship. And I could pick the name of anybody I wanted. And so me, the economist and public policy type, decided that I would be the Lee Rainwater distinguished professor of public policy and economics. And um, it reminds me every day when I look at that little signature block uh, how much Lee meant to me and how close I was to him. So we're really happy you could be here. Uh, that's an, I made my quota. Janet, am I in time? Good. Uh, now I want to introduce, for those of you who don't know it, this is Carol Rainwater, who is always Lee's partner. She would even come to Luxembourg now and then. You can see her in the T-shirts up there and <laughs> dressed better than that. And... Um, she wants to greet you all as well, and then we'll go from there. Carol. I didn't know, um, I didn't realize that I'd have an excuse for not being able to talk well by being hit in the head. <laughs> <laughs> And instead, I was going to tell you um, that if there weren't uh, so many people here who know me, um, I would say that the dog ate my notes. It wasn't the dog, it was my commuter, computer, which went, I mean, my uh, printer, which went on the fritz. So I, I just uh, am so pleased that this is taking place. And uh, I thank the uh, sponsors of this occasion, the Department of Sociology at Harvard, and the uh, Stone Center on uh, Socioeconomic Inequality at CUNY uh, Graduate Center, and the home of LIS. Uh, uh, it's thanks to them that this is taking place today. Um, Mary Waters and um, the department staff have um, uh, helped Janet so much in uh, taking care of the details and preparing for today. Day. Um, uh, she certainly, she and her uh, staff in New York at CUNY uh, had plenty to do. I thank uh, uh, Susanna and Odette for all they've done, but I have a question. Why don't you do something about the weather? 
Um, before um, there was uh, LIS, before there, uh, Lee was at uh, the Department of Sociology or at, uh, uh, at Harvard or at uh, Washington University, there was Social Research Incorporated and the University of Chicago. Um, uh, Lee and I met in 1956 when I um, went to work on the administrative staff at uh, SRI. Um, but um, actually, I don't know, did he make it or not? I guess he hasn't been able to come. I was hoping that today there was going to be another person who had known Lee even longer, even before I did, and that was Robert Weiss, who was a student with Lee at the University of Chicago. <laughs> oh, there he is. Hey. Hi, Bob. Thanks for coming. Uh, there is uh, another uh, person uh, who was at uh, Chicago uh, uh, and who worked with Lee and me at social, re social research, and he, Gerald Handel, could not make it, he and his wife Ruth, but their son, Michael Handel, is here today, and many of you know that he was also uh, 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 in the department, of so a, a student, a graduate student at the Department of Sociology here. Thank you, Michael, for representing our dear friends. Um, I, I, uh, when we lost Lee, um, Janet was in Luxembourg. Tim was in Paris with Marcy, his wife Marcy Carlson, and their adorable little boy Finney on sabbatical. But that did not stop them from giving us every bit of support they could possibly give. Um, they were wonderful. Janet, with the help of Dan Cahill, had put together the most beautiful film a film uh, that recognized uh, Lee and his work and was sent out to colleagues all over. Um, <clears throat> then, as uh, they just kept doing things, coming to see us here, Catherine and myself. And um, I must say that they, they helped so much in uh, uh, making things easier for um, me and for my children, Catherine and John Rainwater, and uh, John's wife, Susan Stevenson. It was really great. Uh, as uh, Tim pointed out, when given the opportunity, he named his um, professorship at uh, Wisconsin um, with, uh, after Lee, and that was also terrific. Within a few months after uh, Lee's death, um, Janet and Tim contacted me and said they got this idea to put together annual lectures um, that would um, memorialize uh, Lee and, and uh, recognize his work. Uh, of course, I was delighted, and uh, once they had uh, thought through it a bit, they started to contact people who, uh, colleagues of Lee's and friends of Lee's who uh, would do, uh, make donations to holding uh, these events. And uh, the response from uh, these people uh, was immediate and generous. Um, and uh, I, I thank them for that. Um, I, I, I want to um, uh, say, as I look out at this audience and see colleagues of Lee, dear friends, from all different groups and individuals. I'm talking about Daisy Chain, the mermaids, and all of these wonderful friends. I thank you so much for being here. But again, I wanna thank the sponsors, contributors, Robert for coming here. Oh, I do wanna say one thing about Robert. There could be no better person to give the first lecture than Robert. He was there with Lee long before this started. You just pointed out to me it was before, not during. He, had, he shared data from Sweden at the very outset uh, and uh, has been there.
for Lee and Tim, now for Jan, and it's wonderful that he is our speaker today. And most of all, I want to thank Janet and Tim. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, uh, I'm Mary Waters, and I'm the chair of the sociology department. And uh, I want to welcome everybody here on behalf of the sociology department. Uh, I want to thank our fantastic staff, uh, especially Suzanne Ogungbadero and um, Odette Binder, who have done so much work uh, to put everything uh, together so nicely for us today. And I want to just say uh, a few words. Uh, many of my colleagues who knew uh, Lee and who, who never met Lee are here today to, um, to uh, join with us in, in remembering him and in, in thinking about the issues that, that he thought were important with uh, Bob's talk. I wanted to just say a, a few words about Lee and our department. Lee taught in the sociology department from 1969 till 1992 when he retired, and um, he uh, what, had an illustrious career. And as I thought about Lee's career, I thought about what makes us such a successful and uh, um, really uh, uh, terrific department to work in and to train students. And I realized that Lee personified many of the things and actually did many of the things before his time that, that now are, are spreading throughout the nation, but that, that Harvard was one of the first to do. And I would just mention a, one or two of them. One is that um, our department is well known, and we've been, we've been recruiting potential graduate students the last few weeks, and so I've been talking up the department. And I realize that everything I've been stressing about our department really uh, uh, Lee personifies. One is that we, we, um, we train our students equally in qualitative and quantitative research and believe that the, the method is what is important for asking a particular question and that you're not assigned to one or the, the, uh, one or the other of these things, which of course Lee uh, did throughout his career. Um, we are an empirical department and a department that really thinks about um, uh, the real world and also the implications for policy. Uh, many of our, our faculty and, and graduate students think about that and of course Lee uh, was a trailblazer for that. Um, I think about Lee's teaching, and um, when I first came in 1986 as a new assistant professor, I was told by some of the other professors that um, Lee's course, uh, which was on um, uh, class and on poverty and on the working class, attracted uh, overwhelmingly students who were the first in their, in their um, families to go to college. And it was one of the few classes where they saw themselves and they got to think about their own uh, trajectories. And he was, was really uh, appreciated by students for that. And, and we still uh, pride ourselves in attracting those kinds of students. And finally, the topics that Lee uh, devoted his life to, uh, poverty, inequality, comparative research, urban research, uh, race um, and uh, public policy are all things which are very strong in our department, among other things that we, um, we, we specialize in, but that he really uh, set uh, an agenda that really lives on and lives on in our students. And we're just very proud to have uh, been the place where Lee did a lot of his important re research. And we're happy to celebrate that with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just, uh, I'm Janet Gornick now, Professor of Political Science and Sociology at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Uh, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. I think we've heard all this. And again, I do want to thank especially Suzanne and Odette, who uh, Mary sort of lent to me as we were uh, getting organized. Um, I myself also um, knew Lee well. He was a big figure in my life. I met Lee in the 1970s when I was an undergraduate here. But I encountered him again in 1989 when I was his teaching assistant. He was teaching a class at the Kennedy School where uh, I had been affiliated and I was a PhD student here by then. And uh, he turned to me one day and said, um, 
do, I need to hire somebody to build a social policy database for LIS, which I had just learned about. It was five years old at the time. And I, he described the job to me, and I said, that sounds interesting. It was a part-time research job. We were standing at the Kennedy School, and he asked me when I could relocate. And I said, oh, this job at William James? And he said, <laughs> the job is in Luxembourg. And I said, um, where is Luxembourg? Which I think Tim, Tim tells the same story. I wasn't sure if it was Liechtenstein or I, somewhere a little. Anyway, I ran home and looked on the atlas. That's what you did in those days. And I thought, that looks interesting. So I came back the next day, and I said, OK. Um, I finished my exams here, and I moved to Luxembourg, where I stayed almost two years. And um, thus, for me, uh, began the rest of my life. So that one exchange with Lee, uh, and then he chaired my dissertation, and that one exchange with Lee shaped my entire career of 27 years so far. So um, Lee retired. Harvard rules uh, said he could no longer chair the dissertation, so in stepped Chris Winship, thank you, who I always say, how do I say this politely? He uh, kicked my butt, which was not Lee's style, for those of you who knew Lee, and told me to hurry up and finish, which I did very quickly. So he s scared the heck out of me, and I finished really fast. And I thank you, Chris, as well. So, okay, so that's that. So um, I've been involved with LIS all those years. Tim was director for 23 years. I was director for 10, and we've just recently reorganized. Um, so let me tell you what we're going to do. Um, I'm determined to keep us on schedule. I want to just say a couple of words about the lecture series. You have a program in front of you. And as Carol mentioned, several people uh, very quickly and very generously uh, donated. We have in hand money for about eight years. So we'll start calling you in about five years if we get a little panicky, Tim and I'll start calling you. But people gave very generously. What we decided to do um, was to alternate the lecture each year between here, because it was Lee's home for so long, also mine for a long time, and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, and where Phil Kazins has come today also to wave the CUNY flag and uh, represent the sociology program there, which also gave. So uh, we'll announce in the fall the date and a new speaker. The donors are the selection committee. And uh, we will uh, certainly keep going for the next many years. And we hope that the rainwaters will join us uh, in New York each year. OK, the next thing that we're going to do, um, we've um, left just 10 minutes for this. So uh, Carol made reference to uh, a video. In fact, the video was made in 2011, but of course what you're remembering is right after Lee died, uh, we recirculated it and at that point we were you know, tweeting and all the new things that we can do to put things out in circulation. What we decided to do back um, in around 2008 or 9 was to capture the story of the founding of LIS because it really was unusual. It doesn't seem un as unusual. Sherry Minton is nodding, by the way. She was a big part of, oh, big part of our, our LIS life as well. Um, it, so when LIS was founded, it was an extraordinarily revolutionary project for everybody involved. And uh, it was unusual for Luxembourg, which did not have a research community, to welcome this, this marvelous little project. Um, and there were six people who really put it together. Uh, one of whom was Lee, and one was Gaston Chabert uh, and Tim, and then three others. In any case, uh, Dan Cahill, or who's doing the video today, and I um, interviewed these six people, which I think took us to four countries and many different many hours of. We have about six and a half hours of video. Uh, we're only behind the camera, and we turned it into this short story of the founding of LIS. And so I want to show you ten minutes of it today. Um, I hope it's linear enough. I just chose a few clips the other day. Uh, you will see Lee talking. I gave Carol a warning. I didn't want anybody to be too surprised to see Lee appear and, 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 and speak. But he, Lee will tell an anecdote, actually, um, about how thrilled he was with the technical side of LIS, um, which Sherry Minton was really deeply part of. Uh, I'll just say this right now. I don't think this, li this line, it's not in the excerpt, but um, it's in the longer video. That So back in the 1980s, I guess Lee was sitting in his office writing computer code and sending it up to the server on the 11th floor. Am I right? Is that how the, the 13th floor? So the way the story was told at some point, and this is probably apocryphal, I'm not sure, Sherry, you can tell people later, was at some point the, the, what was said was uh, if he can sit in his office on the sixth floor, fifth floor, and send his, I should have prepared for this, right? If he could sit on the fifth floor and send his runs up to the 13th floor, why couldn't he send them to Luxembourg? And thus was born our remote execution system, which made us world famous. So uh, that's what happened. So I'm going to show you just 10 minutes, and then uh, I'll just take Three seconds to introduce Robert, um, the absolute perfect choice for this lecture, as I think you'll see also from this, from this video. In the 
late 1970s, the American sociologist Lee Rainwater became acquainted with Gaston Chabert, a Luxembourgish psychologist. Gaston directed a research institute in Luxembourg known as SEPS. He also held a faculty position at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Gaston and Lee came together again in August of 1982 at a conference on poverty that was held at Clark University. The Swedish sociologist Robert Erickson was also there, as were several other European and American social scientists. Participants at the Clark Conference discussed the idea of creating a cross-national project that would enable high-quality comparative research. Those conversations led to the launch of the Luxembourg Income Study in 1983 in Luxembourg. Three people who were involved from its inception, Lee Rainwater, Robert Erickson, and Tim Smeeding, remember Liss's beginnings. Three others who helped Liss to take root and develop, Serge Allegretza, Marc Sigrand, and John Coder, also contribute their early memories. I knew Gaston because he had looked me up, because he had asked a colleague at uh, Clark who in the Cambridge area was concerned with problems of poverty. That was Tamara Haraven, who was a professor of history at Clark. Uh, and she invited me to dinner to meet Gaston. Uh, uh, and then Gaston invited me up to Luxembourg a couple of times, if I remember correctly, uh, just to talk or in one case to listen in on a conference he had of the people from the different poverty studies in, in uh, Europe. The, uh, so when he presented the idea to me uh, and to Marty Ryan, who was with me, uh, then uh, he uh, said he would like to have a conference at Clark, bring his people from Europe over and uh, uh, meet with some Americans who knew, uh, who did poverty research. My first uh, meeting with Lee was in the 1960s. Lee came to Stockholm to, in order to use the level of living study from 1968. And from that on, we had quite a lot of contact. And so I, I had a, uh, a, a long experience of Lee uh, as an excellent sociologist and a good person. Uh, Gaston, I only met at the first, uh, what do we say, meeting where Liss was, was more or less uh, decided upon without being, uh, we, being formally established at Clark University in Massachusetts. Uh, that was the, and I'm, I had, didn't meet anyone, meet Gaston before that. So we talked back and forth. Uh, he had his own crew from, uh, from Luxembourg, and he knew the people who uh, uh, had done other poverty studies uh, in Europe for this European Union uh, uh, project. Uh, but he didn't know anything about the work that was done in the Scandinavia on levels of living. So I told him about uh, Sten Johansson and uh, Robert Erickson and pointed out they represent a, diff a different way of going at this than the people he was uh, working with, in, uh, particularly in Luxembourg. Uh, and I gave him the names of uh, poverty researchers from the uh, Poverty Institute. Lee was the one. And Lee was the one who, who, who had the ideas of, of looking at income inequality, looking at comparative studies of income inequality, to have the basis for doing that, etc. I think that all that, I think, was clearly Lee's, uh, Lee's uh, contribution. And, and so I think that if one should really point at somebody who is the father of Lee, it is.
I'll, I'll never forget the first time I put in a whole bunch of uh, runs and just seeing them roll off the printer <laughs> with all of those countries, uh, I think maybe we had nine countries by that time, was very, very exciting. Uh, and then the fact that uh, once the internet got going and email, the fact that this could become a totally uh, automatic process was also very exciting, at least for me. Uh, lots of people treat the, those issues as, well, I hope it works and if it does work, good, but you know, they weren't really interested in the uh, nuts and bolts of it. But uh, I, that was an extra bonus in a way, a non-social science bonus from uh, building the project. You know, altogether the idea was that we were in this together. Um, we were trying to learn from each other. We realized that we we're providing customers with something. And we kept, I think, to the motto I set back in 1988, which was work hard, play hard. We were sincere about helping people, and uh, I think that reputation has carried us to this point. In the early time when this was started, Comparisons of, of, of income data was just based on, on, on what was produced by the governments. And what the governments produced were, of course, not comparable. And this, this was, I, I think, the most important aspect. And this is the intellectual achievement, to, to see both that it had to be done and it could be done, which I think is a, it is a, a piece of intellectual shall we say, uh, courage. The great event of my life, one of them anyway, uh, in September 2008, the uh, University of Stockholm offered me and I received an honorary doctorate for the work I'd done with Liz. It was just absolutely amazing, totally blown away. Me, an honorary degree? I had a wonderful time and um, I'll always have fond memories and a special place in my heart for Liz. Lee and I are really proud of what we started and even prouder of what's being grown out of it. To be president of Liz, I must say, was only for one period of hard work. Otherwise, since this was a project that, that was following exactly the ideas I had about how, how comparative work should be done, or rather, what, how, what the infrastructure for comparative work should look like. In that respect, I, I was very happy about being, being president of a nice institute. So, I guess in the end we were lucky. Um, I think we did well because of hard work and because of luck and because I had Lee as a partner and now Janet and Marcus after us, uh, because we've had loyal employees and because they're just really good people. So I, I'm thankful. Lee, I think, in his retirement said, this will be the most important thing I've done. He thought that. Now, this is Lee Rainwater, who's done a lot of really important work, in case you didn't understand what ghettos were about in the, eight, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and so forth. Uh, so Lee could claim fame to a bunch of other stuff. Not me. The best thing I will ever do, have done, is less. And I'm really proud of what we could be accomplished again and where the project's going. It's now my pleasure to introduce Robert Erickson. I think you can see why we were very grateful that he agreed to give the first lecture because he's so integrally related to the project and to Lee and so forth. And when I became the director of LIS, 
uh, 2006 to 2016, Robert served as the board president and a really uh, crucial advisor for those five years. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you. Okay, let me say that, that as I uh, was clear from the video there, that my first meeting with Lee and with Carol, actually, was uh, around 1970. I wonder if whether 69 was right that, but never mind. Uh, and, and the point was that Lee came to Stockholm because he was looking for new data sets and new ideas how to look at inequality and poverty. And I would say, as much as I had follow, I'd followed him during his career then, he stuck, he stuck to that uh, subject and wrote exactly about inequality and poverty. And this lecture is a small step behind him in, in, on, on uh, inequality. So the idea is I should talk about exactly social selection in education and its consequences for mobility. OK, but I'll say uh, social mobility, inter general mobility, intergenerational mobility is an immense area. So if I should talk about it, I have to pick and I'll select what I should say. I can only take up a minor fraction of the issues that come out. So uh, in the, what I will select, I will discuss social rather than economic mobility, and I will emphasize class mobility rather than status attainment, which are the, the, on the one hand the, the tradition in economics and the other the tradition in in, in uh, so two traditions in sociology, and, and I, I'm there to say that status attainment has been more done here in the US, whereas class mobility has been done more in the Europe. So I thought coming here, I should talk about class mobility. And secondly, I would say this, that education is the most important mechanism relating class origins to class destinations. Uh, that is both for the means to for the children from the more advantaged classes to be, uh, remain advantaged, and it's a means for those from less advantaged classes to uh, be, be become better off. So I will then, given the importance of, uh, of, of education, I will start discussing how educational attainment depends on social origins and then discuss to some, exp some aspects of the role of education in class mobility. And where I will finally say a few words about the goal to increase social mobility and the possibility to reach this goal by pos political measures. In studies of the association between social background and educational attainment, it was very early observed that children from more advantaged backgrounds uh, did on average perform better at school and also but he also given their performance at school they choose more academic uh, lines uh, of, of, of further education then. Uh, this was shown by my old professor Boalt wrote his dissertation on this aspect really in 1947 and uh, uh, Sandy Jenks over there had a paper, I think it was in the academic mind, that he also had this, this, this uh, result. Uh, and so this was a... And, and then it became really a major uh, case in sociology with the publication of the book by Raymond Bouton on... on, on, on uh, I don't remember the name of the book any longer, but it was certainly on, on education and the selection in education. He called these two mechanisms, the mechanism that children do better at school and therefore go better further on. The primary uh, effect of social selection in education, and, but he also had the, the, there is also a direct effect that says by other mechanisms than education for the connection between social origins and destina uh, destination origins. And that he called the secondary effects. It's a slight 
slightly, and this has been established, so this is really what we have to stick to, but it's slightly inconsequential that the indirect effect of from class origin to class destination is uh, called the primary effect, and the direct effect from class origin is called the secondary effect, but that is how it is. It's not we can much we can do it both. It was really two French demographers, uh, uh, Gijard and Bastide, who, who really came up with these two terms. But that was unknown to most of us because it was in a paper in French in demography. Uh, okay, but this, this now, this pattern has been observed in a very large number of countries. Uh, so, and, and uh, in, in 2013, Michelle Jackson actually produced uh, an edited volume on where you could see the pattern from, from on this one. And we could uh, summarize the, the in, in, in the following way. And I should, this way, yeah, okay. So th this is really uh, uh, a schematic picture of, of the whole process. And that is, so what you have here, you have two curves of uh, grade, grade point averages for girls from the uh, salariat, that is the upper professional and uh, managerial fathers and mothers. This is the, 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 the uh, uh, grade distribution for girls from uh, the working class, and this is the grade distribution for, for girls from the salariat. And it's a rather major difference between them. The difference is of the size of a standard deviation in the distribution here for class, uh, girls from the working class. I've taken uh, just one example, the, the, given the girls and, and, and from, from leaving primary school at the age of 16, and that's what it, it is about. The other two curves then, that is the, at this point, the, this is the point in Sweden where the children have to divide how to continue, right? And the, the crucial choice is whether you go to an academic line in uh, secondary school or whether you go to vocational, a vocational line or perhaps just drop out. And so this is the, the, the and, and what these two curves show, and I'll push the right point here, there, yes. What these two curves show, they are the, they are estimates of the probability of continuing on uh, to, to uh, the academic lines in upper secondary school. And uh, this curve is then the probability for girls from the salariat, and this line is then the, the, uh, the probability for girls from the working class. The, di the difference here is rather great. If you take somewhere in the middle here and, and you, you look, so the difference here is about 25%. That is, the, it was, the, it was a, a, the girls from the working class had a 25% higher chance to go to the academic lines of upper secondary the girls. So, and, and the whole, and the, the, the combined effect of uh, the, 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 these two effects. So, if, if you, I mean, you, de, 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 you deal with them a little in, in mathematically, and then you get the, the outcome of, of how, how many, are you, you in principle multiply the, the distribution with the, with, with the, the, the uh, transition curve, which is, by the way, estimated by, by a logistic regression. And uh, then the, the, the girls from the uh, salariat, 68% went on to academic lines of uh, secondary school, whereas 24% of the girls from the uh, working class went on. So it's a major difference. Uh, that, and it comes from both ways. That this was the point. This was the, what Boalt uh, found. It was what Boudon came out with, that it, it, it's both effects here are, are operating. Uh, we, you can say that the assumption between, between, behind this model is that students 
through knowing their grades, the grades are known to the students, of course, before they decide where to go. Knowing their grades, they, they have some information about their potential, and then on that uh, uh, basis, they will decide. But on that, when we take, do it this way, we, with all probability, underest uh, underestimate the importance of choice here uh, that is given by the two S curves here. Because if, you, if we assume that girls who earlier in school decide that, yeah, I want to go on to academics, they may work harder at school already. So, that, so they may get grades, better grades, due to uh, the choice of continuing to upper secondary school. So um, I, we could try to look at another curve here. Look here. Uh, yes. So instead, uh, in this data set, we also have a, a, a cognitive test. It's based on uh, verbal, spatial, spatial, and numeric skills. And, and it it's, has all the qualities of, of the psychological scales that you are used to. So here we have really uh, now the, 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 the distributions here are now the distributions in this cognitive ability, right? This is, re this is really uh, Hernstein and Murray's bell curves. This is precisely what it is, actually. Uh, and uh, whereas the, the and, and these then are the probabilities of choosing, of the girls choosing upper secondary school uh, given their grades, oh sorry, given their, their uh, cognitive ability. And what we can see is that the difference between the uh, distributions of cognitive ability and the distributions, uh, the, the difference between, oh sorry, the difference between the distributions of cognitive ability are closer to each other, actually, than the, the distribution of grades. And which you can assume partly at least is due exactly to this earlier decisions of continuing that is more often probably taken by girls from the salaria than from girls from the working class. So here we get, as you see, and it, you, you get actually a larger, it's, it's a consequence since it will still be exactly the same proportions. So it, it necessarily consequences of, of uh, uh, these two uh, distributions being closer to the other, these will be more, more different. And if you look around also in somewhere in the middle of the, here, yeah, you get the difference amounts to around 37 percentages, percentage points between the two, uh, two, two girls and from the two classes. It was, and if you remember, it was 24 percent for, for given giving grades. And, but in this case, the, the test results are all known, unknown to the girls. They are not uh, further. So in a sense, you can say that they give, the grades don't provide them with this uh, security of, or, or this information about their, their possible uh, abilities to continue to academic. And, and even if, of course, those with very high grades, uh, uh, sorry, high uh, cognitive ability probably also got good grades. But, but so it's, of course, a high correlation between them. But I mean, the, the, what they do is, is, this does not provide them the assurance that they will do well at upper secondary school. And uh, yeah, and, and I would say, I didn't say it about the, I could, just to, if we go back, it's worthwhile seeing that at the ends of the distributions, either no one goes on, or at the top grades, everyone, both girls go on to, to, to higher, to, to this academic lines of upper secondary school. And this doesn't really happen here. We got a larger difference. Also with the top uh, cognitive ability, there is a, a not uh, a, a difference of some importance. But I just want to, I could say like this. This is a 
example for one group. Uh, I could have chosen boys, I could have chosen other courts, I could have chosen other countries, other time periods, other transitions. The picture would be in principle be exactly like this. It would be, of course, different. The distributions would be different. The, the transitions would be different. But the, 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 the picture would exactly stay this. And this is really the result that we get. And that, that Michelle Jackson, in her book, could show that for all the countries involved, I think it was uh, nine European nations plus the United States. And, and they all come up with the same pattern, actually. Okay, uh, oh, did I? No, okay. Let me see, where, where am I? Yeah, uh, it, it just to, to uh, is this? Yeah, uh, okay, so, so just to take, to see the another example. I take the same, uh, test results. I mean, the, the, the distributions are, of course, the same, except for a few missing data. Whereas now we have the probability of getting a university exam. And what we can see is that we get, we get rather major difference already, also at rather high cognitive ability between uh, girls from the salariat and from the uh, so uh, I, I, as I said, you, you can we look at this in very many ways, and, and you can set it up. So if, for instance, one natural way to do it is to look at only those who uh, graduated from the academic lines of upper secondary school from where nearly all the, the university students come. And, uh, uh, you would get the same picture. The, the, the two distributions would be pushed more together. The two also, the, the, uh, the, the transitions would be closer. But the major, this is the, the picture would lo really look the same. Uh, Stephen Morgan uh, here in the US has pointed out that this simple two-factor model with primary and secondary effects cannot be regarded as fully representing the causal mechanism by uh, the, well, this, uh, well, he particularly pointed out that here in the United States, as he wrote, race would be an important factor that should be involved in the, in the model. Uh, he thought that uh, uh, this, this may not be so, so much of a problem in Europe. But I think that with the increasing ethnic diversity of the European nations, we will certainly we should certainly consider this factor as well. But on the other hand, in spite of Morgan's critique being quite valid, as I see it, uh, it, it the model has some quite considerable heuristic, heuristic value for understanding the process. Because it emphasizes the importance of choice in educational uh, continuation. Particularly, you could say that it points out that it's not only differences in ability and performance that decided uh, decide the educational careers of young people. And um, yeah, okay. So a, a just one issue that was, is relating to choice, which I thought would be interesting to present here because I never took it up in an international connection. Uh, it was by a, a group of economists in Sweden in the 1990s, and also the then conservative government came, out, came and said that it may be, I mean, the, 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 the social selection in school has been a, a issue that has been, uh, Swedish politicians have been at since the 1940s at least. And so they, and they came up and said, perhaps 
The social selection at school is because there is too low, little income uh, inequality in Sweden. And the argument uh, is, not, is, is quite sensible, you say. It says that while uh, children from more advantaged background, they will take on, go on to university anyway. But for the kids from the working class, why should they take the risk of going to university if there is not a, a substantial economic returns to, to this uh, fact. So I think it's, it's a sensible argument, but I still wanted to test it. And, and uh, Janne Jonsson and I tried to do that. We started with the assumption that if children from the working class are more influenced by economic returns, in their decision to continue to higher education or not. It ought not only to concern the choice of educational level, but it also concerned what track to follow. So we had access to a very large data set with detailed information on levels and fields of education. And also, uh, and we also for, for, and we could, for each combination of level and field of or not each, but for many, uh, we could set down the, the, the average earnings of men. We took men in the ages 30 to 47 working full time. So for each these of these economic, uh, uh, or oh, sorry, educational groups, we could apply a monetary value to it. And we would say, and the idea was then, of course, that if it was the case that kids from the working class were more interested in money, they ought to go for the educational combinations or the edu educational tracks that gave most money. And so what we did was we regressed for, then we had a, another data set, of course, with, with younger people. And we regressed the choice of educational track in tertiary education, represented them by the money value, money value of, of that track, on the uh, grade point averages from high school, uh, on its square, on, on we firm mode included sex, parent social class, parental education, and the graduation line in academic secondary school which there are some different. And so we had about 29,000 students from which we could look. The groups from which we, we estimated this uh, e value, the economic values of the educational tracks, there were, uh, so I think it was 56 such uh, groups. And no, in no case, we had less than 100 cases in a group to, in order to have a fairly stable estimate of, of the economic returns. The first model accounted for 22% of, of the dependent value. But we then, there is one piece missing when we do, did this, we thought, and that was the cost of uh, the educational line. So what we added to the model was the length of the supposed length. There was a, an established length of, of each educational track. So we added that to the model. We then came up to an R, R square of 0.45, which is fairly decent, I would say. And in the end, then, we have it here. I have to, I don't, can't find the data any longer, so I have to scan the picture from the paper where we published it. So what we have here is, here we have grades, the grade point average from uh, the upper secondary school before entering university. Here we have this money value of, of, of the educational tracks. And the, 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 it, this is the upper uh, managerial and professional class. These are other non-manual. These are self-employed and, and employers. And these are farmers and workers. And so the interesting case here is now, those who, want, who chose the, the, the tracks paying were really the kids from uh, upper class background or higher class background. You could perhaps assume that they knew how much it costs to live the life they want to live. I mean, uh, and, and uh, 
I, so, so in the sense, what we could show by this paper was that it wasn't, it was rather, it, it was really went against the idea that kids from the working class were the ones who went for the money in, when choosing education. And I can, to my satisfaction here, that, uh, say that I never heard the argument mentioned after this paper, actually. <laughs> uh, but why may it be that students from more advantaged backgrounds choose to the high paying tracks, uh, tracks apart from, from this idea? And I have the idea, there is an idea from two, an excellent paper by two American sociologists, Keller and Savaloni had a paper in Social Forces 1964, and it is, and they, the, no, damn it, that was the wrong way. Here we are. I mean, what, and this is a very schematic picture of their idea. That is to say, you, we have, here we have educational level. Here we have the subjective value of uh, choosing that education. Okay, and then we have, and then we say, then we have two, two persons, say two girls from, uh, with different uh, social background. Uh, for both of them, the, va the subjective value of more education increases with the, with the educational level. But, and this was the, the idea by Keller and Savaloni, at the value, the subjective value of additional education uh, is less when, it, when you have passed your aspiration level. You can think of it like this, that uh, you, if you compare the, the assumed subjective value of becoming a certified nurse for, from a, for the daughter of a supermarket cashier and from a, for a physician. It's rather probable that they, they value this uh, education differently. And this, of course, is, is here. So at this point where it's supposed to the, 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 the aspiration level of the girls, say, from the working class. After that, it increases at still, more education is still valuable, but the increase is not as sharp. And this only happens for the other girls when she lives, reaches her aspiration level here. And then the assumption is that these, these two go on uh, uh, with the same, the slope is the same, that is to say, we assume the same process, and the, what is different is the situation that defines the aspiration of the girls. Uh, and I think this was, in my view, a very important paper, because at that time it was the idea that uh, the working class didn't actually value higher education. But here we, they assumed that uh, the, the, the valuation is the same. It's only the situation that differs. I think it's a, 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 it's a paper that has, could, could have been observed more than it has, I think. And this, of course, the, and the consequences, of course, that at certain, okay, the value of a certain education is higher for children from more advantaged backgrounds. So they have more reason to choose this type of, of education. And, uh, uh, Okay, more generally, if we, if we take the two mechanisms here, uh, you can say that differences in performance, the primary effect, can be assumed to be a, uh, depend on a combined effect of nature and nurture. It's probable that kids from advantaged background from the start obtain relatively good cognitive and non-cognitive skills on the basis of the interaction between genetics and environment, on the interaction, op and this interaction, I would say, I, I, I have great difficulties with these people that come out and say that, oh, it's 80% that is genes, or 60% that is genes. You could, it's an interaction, and it starts from the conception and onwards. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, oh yeah. Uh, but I mean, but, Parents with higher education use a more elaborate uh, vocabulary, which is probably part of the explanation that their children, on average, do clearly better on verbal tests, only at the age of three. 
And children from the cell area get the cognitive, that they get the cognitive, cog, sorry, cognitive advantage already at an early age, of course, is to their benefit when they continue. This is Heckman's idea of skill begets skill, right? So, and furthermore, for, for this, children from, with the cell area parents have presumably conditions at home, more space, more equipment, more books, that is to their advantage of leading to a better performance to, to the primary effect. To account for difference in choice to the secondary effects, uh, Janne Jonsson and I selected, su suggested a very simple model. We said that we have to consider the benefits of the education, we should consider the cost of the education, and we have to consider the probability of success. And we put together, uh, with, with some fiddling, you come to a very simple model here saying that the value or the utility of choosing a certain education uh, is dependent on the benefits but, and minus the cost, but the benefits are, depend, are, are partly dependent. They must be valued according to the probability of succeeding in, in the education. And this, the idea with this model, it's a very simple thing. And it's again a heuristic model because if you assume that these benefits and costs are estimated as subjective values, I mean, you get difficulty, you will not test it. But the point is, the point is what we should look at, thinking of, of uh, uh, trying to understand the educational choice of children from different classes. And, and it, it, it's rather good, you can get rather good argument that all three factors actually are to the advantage of children from higher origins. They, they, they have a higher, they get more benefits as we saw, for instance, with the Keller and Savaloni model. They have, they can take the costs much easier of higher education because they have the support from their parents or they can rely on support from their parents, I could say. And they also probably have a higher probability of succeeding because of being more advanced, pushed into have, getting better, so as a guidance from their parents, etc. Breen and Goldtop has a, a other testable model, just uh, looking at, at avoidance of downward social mobility as a, uh, as an important to avoid. The avoidance of downward social mobility will lead working class go kids going to vocational education because that will offer them a good job. And they don't run into the risk of if they go to academic studies, they don't succeed. The, the option of a vocational career may, may not be open any longer. So, so in that sense, this is a... a and, and Jan and I also had some ideas in our paper on, on risk of a, on, on, on this idea. And uh, I mean, f exactly, to, to Breen and Goldtop, the central in their model is risk aversion, that exactly this, that you avoid, you, uh, you try, you avoid the risk of, of downward mobility. The interesting case, I think, is both Keller and Savaloni and Breen and Goldtop here are, are actually in line with Kahneman and Tversky in their prospect theory, because what they all say is that there are differences. The, the, the more is valued, I mean, uh, less, the, a loss, sorry, a loss like downward mobility weighs heavier than gain in terms of, and, and the, it is, and, that, and the Keller and Savaloni, I think, is a very, Keller, Kahneman and Tversky ought to have referred to them, actually. Okay. So, just to say that, okay, what about then social mobility? Uh, the, the, the simplest understanding of, of intergenerational social mobility is, the proportion of children who are in another social class than their parents. And uh, children who are higher up have been upward immobile, children who are further down have been 
downwardly mobile. And the rate of absolute mobility is to a very large extent determined by the, the change of the social structure. That is to say, when in the uh, earlier part of the previous century, when in, uh, industrial work increased and work in, f in farming decreased, children of farmers and farm workers with, necessi with necessity had to move to, uh, to industrial work or some other work, but they had to leave their origin class, which of course leads also then to, 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 to absolute mobility. And uh, the same on what was, has been called in some cases the golden age of social mobility in the 50s and the 60s, when the uh, upper salariat increased very quickly, which opened more room at the top, as some British uh, dramatic wrote, wrote about it. Uh, and, and, uh, but what happens now is that uh, if, as it seems now, the social structure is changing less, we seem to get a larger proportion of low-skilled service jobs. Uh, absolute mobility will probably decrease, and down, downward social mo class mobility will probably, or may increase, I can say. So differences between the distributions of origin and destination are a major determinant of absolute mobility. The other major factor is social fluidity. It refers to the inherent association between the origin classes and the destination classes. And it, 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 we can measure it so it's not uh, dependent on differences between the distributions of origin and destination. And given the so you could say social fluidity refers to an individual's probability of reaching one position in the class structure rather than another in relation to the corresponding probabilities of uh, individuals from other social origins. And this relation is very close to a, a precise definition of inequality of opportunity, I would say. And given the central role of education for the association between origins and destination, uh, much interest has been devoted to uh, what is called the OAD triangle. So you, and you have, again, uh, uh, an indirect effect, origin over education over to destination in current class, and you have a direct effect, which is, says it's via other mechanisms than education that uh, leads from the origin class and the other. And it, it can be seen as a, only a fragment of Blau and Duncan's path model, of course. But I think even if it's a simple thing, much insight can actually be gained from it uh, and this simple three-way association. And the, the okay, and the, the interesting case is that it has been from time to time shown there is an interaction in this three-way association. Hout, in a very influential paper, found that an observed increase in fluidity in the United States could be accounted for by increasing number of children or young people going to university, because the association between the origin class and the destination class is lower among those with higher uh, with university education, and, and uh, Mike Hart even suggested that there's no association at all. I don't believe that, but it may have been in his data that there is some problems with that. Uh, but but the, then the increasing numbers with higher education or, or with university education accounted for a decrease in class mobility in or rather, he, he looked, I think, if I remember right, on, 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 on uh, status attainment. But never mind, the, 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 the mechanisms are, of course, very similar. This has been shown uh, for several countries. Uh, Torsche, Florencia Torsche, in some very, I think, good papers, 
could confirm the association between parental status and men's status uh, with, uh, that it decreases with increasing levels of education. But she also found that it go, that doesn't go the, old, the way through. That is to say, the association between origin class and destination class was higher among those with advanced degrees as compared to those with bachelor degrees. And this is an interesting case because it gives some support to an idea by Sam Lucas that about maximally uh, maintained inequality. I would interpret it and say that under competition, children and parents from more advantaged background realize that they have to choose their, use their resources for uh, and move up in the educational uh, ladder. So, I mean, and th this is part of, of the problem with much of this research. The question is, does education mean the same? When it was, when I, I went to university, I think we were about between five and 10% of a, a cohort. And does then university education mean the same as when the present cohorts, do that? they are 30, or, or even more than 30% of the court goes to the university, which makes a major difference. So, uh, being going on here, I would say, what about Sweden then? I have, uh, we just look to, I refer, I have some data from Swedish registered data for courts between, born between 48 and 72, and uh, it's the whole Swedish population, so it refers to about two million men and women here. And here you have exactly a way of looking at the same results. I have, I put the data in uh, five quasi courts, born 52 to, uh, to 48 to 52, and here the last one to 68 to 72. And then you have the uh, the association between uh, class, origin class and destination class for those with only basic education, for those with lower secondary education, for those with uh, academic secondary education and lower tertiary. And we have uh, those with ter tertiary education and then with long tertiary education. I, I, did this in order to, to try to, to, to replicate Torsh's study. And what we see here is we find exactly the same basic pattern in Sweden as, as in the United States. The, the, the less education, uh, the higher is the association between origin and destination. We don't really find the, the difference between advanced uh, degrees and uh, degrees on bachelor level. They, they are intermingled here. But, and what we see here is, yeah, there is some change over time, which is in this, now when we talk here, not so important, I think. So uh, the, a, a few words about the model. It's based on what is called the uniform difference model that, that uh, John Goldtop and I developed when we were looking at social mobility. It says like this, that uh, we, if you compare, uh, it, you, you compare the association in each uh, of the 25 tables here uh, with one of them, and this is then the, 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 the association in the, in the, um, uh, grew in the, among men with only basic education born in the first court. And then the point is here that, that uh, we assume the same basic pattern of interaction between origins and destination, but the strength may, may differ. To, bo to be precise, if you take an odds ratio in one table and related to an odds ratio, the, the similar odds ratio in another table. The ratio between these two odds ratios will be exactly the ratio between, uh, given by, by the par parameter values here. So, and but I, 
I'm lying a little when I say that these are men, because the model also includes women. I put the women in the same. So in principle, you have 50, actually. <laughs> OK. And, and, and then it looks like this. And the reason why I put the women in there was, of course, that I was curious about what you see here, that the association is much lower among women than it is among men. And this was especially the case in the early period, when fewer women went to the labor market. And it may have been that it was not so important whether you had this job or that job, which apparently then changed over time. There's another interesting case with the women, and that is that here, tortuous result appears again. That is to say, OK, we have the basic education, women basic education. We have those with uh, lower to, uh, secondary, upper secondary, or, or lower tertiary. Then we have those with on, on, on the bachelor level, and those with advanced degrees, actually, there again, the association is higher. So it's, it's exact replication of tortuous result, actually, that appears here for women. For Sweden. We could also, it's also worthwhile observing the difference between women with only basic education. Because apparently here, you could say, I would say, I think the, 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 the interpretation is that women with only basic education coming from uh, the working class have very little options on the, on the labor market. Uh, OK. Uh, yeah. But yeah, is it obvious that this is the best way to look at it? I mean, I, I truly follow Hart in doing this. I mean, as we said, there is a three-way interaction. So you could look at the interaction some other way. So why not look at it? What is the association between education and class, given origin? Which is it's, it's in principle. And then it looks like this. Uh, and again, we have a pattern that is similar. That is to say, it's this, in principle the same model. So. Uh, here you have the group. Uh, in, oh, well, where am I? What happened? Uh, okay. Uh, there we are. Uh, we have the the group that is uh, uh, in in. They are from the working class in the first court, and then you have. Uh, the the uh, the skilled working class. You have uh, intermediate occupations and self-employed. We have the lower non-manual, and we have the professional and managerial uh, origins. And then we could see a very stable pattern that uh, the higher the class origin, the lower is the association between education and destination class. And uh, this is important. I mean, and the differences are, let me say that it's, it's not the model that brings that the data are, are so, 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 behaves so nicely. It is the, it's because the large sample size, I would say. Uh, but what we can say here is that, uh, what this means is that it's an interesting case. It's, it's a clear case that children from, OK, I can say children. I do the same. This, these are women, and it's exactly the same pattern. What we can see again uh, was the interest to have women in the model with the same model with men, because you can see originally the association between education and class was much higher for women than for men. But it decreased much quicker. So here is really they are very close on the same level, more or less. And what you can also see, but what we see here that children from higher origins, they have more options in choosing jobs than, than based on, on, on education, which is, I think, an important uh, interest. 
to look at. And we could say that uh, in, in, in uh, modernization theory, say like uh, what Tryman wrote the paper on 1970, right? So which was a very good paper actually. But, but that, that he, he came up with this idea that given the development, and it, of course it, it's the whole functional theory that is behind it actually, uh, that given the, the development of industrial and post-industrial societies, uh, competition increases all the time, which pushes with necessi necessi necessity pushes the, the, the uh, that sk skills and competence will become more important and other factors of workers will become less important in uh, allocation to jobs on the labor market. And what we can see here is that Sweden doesn't fit to that pattern really. Because one of the things that should happen is exactly this. This could absolutely not happen. That uh, you get, uh, you can have a, a, a difference in, in, in uh, that the more education you have, you still, given the origin, you have, you have more options in the, or sorry, the, the, given the origin, the, the association between uh, education and, and destinations are, are actually become weaker with, and this will happen if it's the case that the upper managerial class increases in size. We, we, if we take the same argument as Hout did with regard to, to the association between origin class and destination, the association between uh, education and class destinations will decrease, actually, which is an interesting case. Okay, I, I, I realize that I'm, as always, talk too much. Uh, I would like to end by saying a few words about whether the rate of social mobility is uh, responsive to politics. I would say like this, that uh, politicians in several countries, including my own, uh, talk very much about they have to increase social mobility and they have to take measures to increase social mobility. Uh, I saw in the, that, that this, the British government has now come up apparently with some, some, a lot of things that, with this purpose. But the question is, can social mobility really increase as an effect of political action? And I would say overall, uh, by intended political action, my, my answer is on the overall, no. Uh, upward social mobility is, and that is what the politis, politicians have in mind. Uh, they don't want to tell their, their, their electorate that we want to increase social mobility so your kids would have a better, worse chance in the labor I, It actually happened on a meeting in Britain and the, then uh, the, the Minister of Education, in the, this was in the previous government, in the, in the Conservative government came up with a big issue that they would increase social mobility. And after a while I couldn't keep quiet and asked him, how, how should you tell your electorate who is in the upper part of the, uh, of the, the social structure? How can you go and tell them that our politics work hard on uh, that your children should do, shouldn't do as well as you do uh, or have done? And I got an answer of about 15 minutes that said nothing. <laughs> it's, uh, it was a, a remarkable event, actually. <laughs> But okay, let, let's let okay inf, influence in social mobility. I mean, first of all, and this is as I said, it, it, if what, what what we observe, of course, this this idea of social, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, of social um, uh, good heavens, what is it called? Yeah, never mind. The association, uh, the the. Uh, the absolute mobility is, of course, what is observed and seen. And the issue of, of what really pushes the 
uh, absolute mobility is changes in the social structure. And the question is, is really the case that with political action, with, we, you can really change this so in order to improve social mobility, it seems a, a rather weird idea. And what is then the option of, of the, if, if, instead of going on the, on the uh, social selection, or, or rather to, if you want to instead go on the other major factor be, be, between, behind social mobility, social fluidity, to what extent can we influence social fluidity by, uh, by political action? And I think one of the things with a point with the distinction between primary and, effect and secondary effect that it, it seems essential for approaching this uh, uh, question. Uh, Johnson, Jackson and Johnson in this volume edited by Michel Jackson, they found comparing European countries, they found that there were rather small differences in the, effect, in the importance of primary effects which suggest that this is rather basic in, in, in the selection process. The, 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 exactly the issues that goes for why children from more advantaged classes do better at school are more or less the same and are, are probably very difficult to influence. So the, the result will be that should we, by politics, influence uh, social mobility, we have to go and look at, try to do it via education, right? In order to influence social fluidity. And uh, so what Jackson and Johnson's results suggest is this, right? So, but the question is, to what extent, if we think of the three factors that Jan and I put suggested, benefits, costs, and, and probability of success. You can say that benefits are probably very difficult to, that they should differ between by social class. The probability of success is probably also very difficult to influence. So the only thing left is the cost. And that is, uh, seems to be a possibility. You could, there are, the costs of going to, to higher education is fairly high. So, I mean, if you reduce that cost, that ought to have an effect on social selection in education. I'm not so certain. I think that children of, if under increased competition for higher education, exactly what Torsha to an extent found is that okay, under these constraints, still we have to, children must have tried to keep their advantage. And how do they do it? Yeah, they continue further up in the educational system. I mean, I think it's very, very little happened. And I would, so I would say, like, I think it's, it's rather improbable that politicians can find a way to make a major. Or, or even minor effects on social mobility. Social mobility may change, that I'm not saying, but, but, but um, the question of intentional political action behind it, I'm not so certain about. I would say like this, the goal of increased social mobility seems difficult to reach, and it would take a generation for it to be realized. If the aim is to reduce inequality, a more trafficable way leading to me immediate results would be to reduce inequality of results. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, you I've talked yes. too long, as always. That was a depressing ending, I might add. Um, questions? We do have, a, we have about 10 minutes. Maybe we could take a couple of questions. Let me just mention something I think we said. We have a reception outside. Everyone is, of course, invited. And that's supposed to be about 6.15 to 7.15. So I'm going to push us out in just a few minutes. But any questions want to be asked? Either 
from the audience or from the microphone over here? Um, so the level of association is still lower on the long tertiary level yeah. than on the earlier levels. So even if, um, so does that kind of to some extent um, moderate your last comment that even if education saturates, people will still find ways to. Sorry, I, I, I didn't get the question. I'm sorry. I, I, I have to listen a little closer. Right. So um, in your concluding remark, yeah. you, you used Torch's uh, finding um, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, uh, yeah. If, so, so, but, but in Torch's finding, even if, um, even on long tertiary level of education, you, you found, uh, they, she found that. Um, the, the association between family background attainment researched. Yeah. Um, but even after it increased from the level of tertiary, but it's still, it's still lower. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. I mean, uh, the, okay, exactly. Okay, the, it's, it's clearly the case you still have this association. Right. But the, the point is that, and, and uh, there are, I think there are good arguments believing that uh, the, the, uh, among those with less education, I mean, the 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 the, the what, what what you could say is that in those cases, the uh, the direct effect that is the, the 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 direct effect of class background on 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 class destination comes in. That is other mechanism. I mean, and, and it is, uh, the obvious example is really, which is slightly different, and that is the self-employed. Because the association between the origin class and destination class, uh, for that, among those who are, come from, from self-employment, education is much less important. Because the other, other, other factor, yeah, Particularly, of course, if they stay in self-employment, other factors become more important for many, at least many types of jobs. But you are right. I mean, it is still a, a considerable difference. Right. So does that modify your final argument that expansioning, expanding Well, the, the final might... argument is, is what should the politicians do? Okay. So why not, given that, why isn't expanding education a way to increase interge intergenerational mobility? To increase intergenerational mobility. Well, to increase, I mean, I think, I, I mean, the, the, let's put it this way. The argument is really like this, that there are very strong countervailing factors behind. So, the, I mean, the interests of both parents and children to stay in good conditions, in advantage position, is such that resources will be brought into the model. And it, it's, I, I, it's, uh, I think it seems to me, I mean, the, the, it's very difficult for the, uh, on the political side to find means where you can get by this, this basic fact. And precisely the fact that if, if now the kid the, and th this is the interesting case with this, this uh, result with get, hold uh, origin constant and look at the association between uh, education and class destination. And you find that with higher origins you have a lower association, which means that kids from higher origins have other means to, to get into good positions, which means, and which is, and all these things are, I mean, as long as we have, I mean, Hauser and Featherman suggested, and Jones, Hauser and Featherman suggested that uh, social, let's lo, lo say what, what, he is, what we here call social fluidity, will be about the same in uh, nations with a market based on a market system and with a nuclear family based on nuclear families and I think this is precisely what is going on here this 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 two uh, major institutions in societies will form the the, the project process Thank you. I see another comment over here I, well oh, presumably a question but something tells me it's a comment yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I would say, I think, 
the same thing a little differently. Okay. Okay. Um, well-educated parents have one or two children. They invest everything in them. They know how to get through the school system. Their kids never worry about whether they can afford to go to school or not, so the C thing disappears. And then they have connections, their, their business. The big thing is how do you tell a parent that they can't do everything they can for their children? That is the major problem. That is the big class divide. Are you going to be a politician who's going to say, okay, who's out there with uh, their smart little kid and uh, two parents and worked real hard and got the kid in Harvard that you, oh, no, no, you can't do everything you can for, you can't do this and you can't, of course you can. And that's the major problem, yeah. I think. I agree. Good. <laughs> education, education is, it seems no, but, to me, is the, a the, the, the important point is that still you have in a large number of countries, the, the, the politicians come out and say, we should increase social mobility. I mean, I suppose it's based on the idea that, that inequality of results is not so important if uh, there is a high degree of inequality or equality of opportunity. Yeah. But I mean, uh, I think... No, no. You've, I, where, I you think are, that, where you are now is where Solo, that economist is, and Piketty, and a lot of others. Unless you get rid of the inequality to start with, you can have a real hard time working your way through yeah, yeah. a social system to get yeah. there. Thank you, Robert. Do we have one last question? I saw a couple of other emphatic nodding faces, hands. Sandy, can we pull you down here? And we're going to give you the last question. So you said, um, I th rightly, that the big determinant of mobility is the distribution of, the changing distribution of jobs or occupations. Now, that suggests that if the political class wants to change the distribution, it can change the distribution of jobs. It obviously can't change what people do because they're not smart enough to do that. Um, employers have to do that, but they can change what people are paid yeah. um, and what they get to keep. And if you compress the distribution of the monetary part, even that you can't just compress the distribution of anything else, um, then you will have the effect that the, the set of jobs that are available to the next generation are either more equal or, in the case of the United States lately, less equal than the jobs that were available in a previous generation. And you will therefore have either more or less mobility of a certain kind because um, you've changed that distribution of payoffs. Now, that won't have any effect at all on the rank order of mobility. I mean, people will still be moving up and down just, to, just like in the diagrams. But what they think has happened to them will change a lot, I think. That could be. That could be. I mean, I, I think that, that but still the... the the, the uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the yeah, it may be, I mean, that this is an interesting case that, that whether exactly the, the, to what extent, I mean, what people see is exactly absolute mobility. I mean, this idea of, of the association is something that the sociologists thought up in their minds and is still hardly out of them. I mean, that's the, but, but uh, no, okay, I, I think, if, but, but the question is, the, the, the interesting case was that, that what you say is they compress the, the uh, income and distribution, that will have fair. But the interesting case was, as I showed before, the economists in Sweden thought that they should increase income inequality. It is my sad duty to, it's not so sad, to uh, bring us to, the, to a close. Um, Robert, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being Thank you to the Rainwaters for coming and Tim for all your energy over so many uh, years and to so many people in the room here. Um, next year, this um, event will be at the City University of New York, as I've said. Phil will take Mary's role. Um, I want you to know, speaking of this topic, that there was just a big study that came out by Raj Chetty, which we're all very proud of at CUNY because he looked at the 10 campuses in this country that created the most social mobility, the most likely that students entered from a disadvantaged background and then they themselves uh, had earnings, household income in the top quintile. And six of those 10 
colleges were ours at CUNY, so we were very proud of that. So that's just a little reason to tell you why you should all come next year, because if you're interested in social mobility, that's our business, and we want to show off CUNY. So I'm a big CUNY patriot. I'm also a Harvard patriot, so there's a lot more money here than there. So anyway, there you go. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, and please join us at the reception.